Welcome. Today's lesson picks up from your first lesson after March break, which looked a little bit at Stanley Milgram's famous uh, obedience study, where he looked at how uh, people who thought they were actually participating in uh, the support for experiment were actually being tested to see how far they would go to punish another person for the name of science. Uh, it also picks up from your homework, which was again on an experiment uh, that looked at Solomon Ash's line study uh, and sort of the impact of group pressures on conformity. Uh, this experiment, or this lesson rather, uh, it will look at not so much just the questions of conformity and other issues that we were looking at the other day, but more so the benefits of experimentation and also uh, the questions that often have to get addressed when you're looking at how do you design a good experiment but make sure that what you design uh, is a fair and ethical one and, and what would sort of be an experiment that may cross over that line uh, and not be so fair. Uh, we talked really through the beginning part of the course, especially at the beginning, about how social scientists have a lot of uh, data that they like to collect, whether you're a sociologist looking at social patterns in society, um, a psychologist trying to look at how different things may impact a person's behavior, or even an anthropologist who's trying to look at cultures around the world. Uh, data is very important to what you're going to do in all of those particular instances. Uh, and there's lots of tools that you can use to collect data, uh, surveys census data, interviews, statistical analysis, um, visual observations, sometimes just case studies where you immerse yourself within a population and observe how people are behaving. Those are all viable ways of doing research. Uh, one of the other ways that people do research uh, however is experiments and in particular for psychologists but for other social, social scientists as well. Experiments are important for a number of reasons, uh, and they definitely stand out as having particular benefits. Why? Well, let's consider a couple of those factors. Um, one of the first things that's important for an experiment and why it's particularly beneficial compared to other studies uh, is the fact that experiments allow for uh, psychologists and other social scientists to study cause and effect relationships. Uh, we've already seen this a few times this year. Uh, reaching back a couple of months, we looked at uh, Albert Bandura, the famous Canadian scientist who used a Bobo doll test uh, and a TV to determine whether or not children watching an adult being violent to a doll on television may be caused to become more violent uh, because of that particular experience. Uh, and he did that by, again, looking at those children and then comparing them to kids who hadn't had that experience. Um, part of the reason why experiments are so good at allowing one to study his cause and effect relationships uh, is because of a second benefit, and that's the fact that unlike some other things that you might be using for research, for example, a census or an observation where you're just sort of doing casework within the community, um, you can actually directly control and manipulate data and variables in terms of your data to control what you're looking at and isolate certain kinds of factors. Uh, when you look at an experiment, experiments are often designed in very careful ways. Uh, they often hold many variables constant and they try to see how only a couple of variables that are allowed to change may cause a, a change in subsequent behavior. Uh, this is important because it helps to minimize the risk of other variables maybe playing a role in terms of how a person is responding to certain circumstances. And it kind of cleans up some of the mess that exists when you're trying to interpret real life. Um, in real life, when you're trying to look at things like, for example, what causes people to be violent, the challenge that you often have is that you could spend a day with a child and look at how they're acting, but all you're going to see is the immediate influences of that particular day. There's lots of other things that may play a role in terms of their susceptibility to violence, whether it be um, their sort of domestic situation and the kind of parenting they've had, whether it be um, the kinds of games they've been playing on their video game system for the last number of, of years, whether it be their friends and whether there's a lot of violence in the school or with their friend group. Um, you really, you can't isolate when you're in that real life, life setting that easily. Uh, you can't always isolate an experiment either, but oftentimes you do get a little bit of a better opportunity to keep your data um, under control and see how just changing one or two things uh, may make an impact uh, in terms of the results of how people act in those situations. Uh, a third thing that's important is that so long as the experiment is well designed, it can be replicated. Uh, if one questions your results and their reliability, then you could just do the experiment in a different setting. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that really makes experiments so useful is that if you can do an experiment and get a unique and, in, and interesting result, 
and then you can keep doing it and get a similar kind of result, then oftentimes that pattern will actually suggest that it's not just a one-off, but that this actually must be something that's a human nature tendency that you've seen uh, in terms of the results. So it's an important thing that you can replicate because you can verify and back up the information. Uh, two final points, uh, one of them is the fact that when you look at experiments, uh, they provide a lot of quantitative or numerical evidence, which of course is beneficial if you're trying to collect uh, specific numbers and data. Uh, and then the last thing is that oftentimes experiments are useful because they can give you kind of a very short, uh, limited range in terms of a study for something that might be dangerous, that if it works out and you get confidence that, okay, this is, uh, you know, something that we feel works, then you can sort of broaden it to a larger group. And it can, uh, you know, often avoid uh, or, or, or cause people who are doing the experiments to avoid wasting people's time uh, with conclusions that may not necessarily be so certain. Uh, to give you an example that's very simple um, but important, uh, if you ever go to a special needs class uh, in a high school setting, like a real in intensive special needs type class with a lot of kids who have severe things like autism. Well, severely autistic kids, um, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that when they get worked up, one of the things that really helps them is that if you put them in a dark room, sometimes you even have these rooms within the school, and you give them just a single device, like an item that creates neon lights or sort of um, some other kind of light stick uh, or something like that, then it actually has a calming effect. Well, they didn't just guess at that particular conclusion, but it was shown through limited studies that eventually, as they were replicated and kept yielding the same sorts of results, um, took on a larger sort of role within society. But again, the small sort of individual study created a broader benefit. Now, there's a lot of reasons why, and we just talked about these, why experiments are beneficial. And, and I've only really sort of scratched the surface of that particular list. Um, another fact that you have to consider when you're looking at experiments is that if you're going to run a good experiment, you can't just run any experiment, but you have to hopefully run one that mimics real life. Uh, usually when you're looking at psychological work, you're trying to see how people will behave in actual society. Uh, and if you run an experiment, you want to make sure that it feels like life, because if it doesn't, then there's a bias implicit. Uh, is the person behaving a certain way because they know they're in the experiment? Are you actually getting real results or are you getting a sort of test tube result that only exists because of the fact that the person is aware that there's a fishbowl and that they're being observed. Uh, this is difficult, and it's a difficult sort of fine line sometimes for a psychologist, because while you want your experiment to be as authentic as possible, um, when you're dealing with difficult issues or issues where there may be some kind of risk involved, um, you also have to sort of keep a level head. Um, you want to make sure that you respect the person who's doing the study and you want to make sure that while you're gaining useful authentic research you're not necessarily crossing ethical boundaries. Um, and, and certainly when you have research that goes too far, um, while it might have value, it's always tainted um, by the fact that those ethical questions are there. And in fact in some cases uh, the risk is certainly not worth the reward. One example of those kinds of studies that I'm going to talk to you about today involves drug trials that occurred in 1969. Um, there's actually a word that goes in front of drug trials in terms of its sort of popular, uh, I, I guess, uh, reference, but I've left that out for a reason because it would give away what this is actually going to deal with. Um, in the 1960s, lots of people used drugs. I think that's well known. Um, a lot of new drugs like LSD, uh, speed, uh, others were becoming more common as you had a generation of people dealing with a lot of change and a lot of people, especially in North America, who were really experimenting. Um, when people were looking at drugs, they were concerned because drug use often leads to addiction. Uh, addiction is a very important psychological phenomenon. It doesn't have to necessarily to be towards a substance. It could also be towards an activity, but it involves situations where people are driven compulsively to have a habit towards using a substance or being a part of a particular activity or participating in activity because it gives them some sense of pleasure. Uh, when a person gets into one of those situations, oftentimes they lose control of their intake. And what that means is that they can't really sensibly use or do what they're doing, use the substance or do what they're doing because they've lost that general common sense. Uh, if we go back to Freudian language, uh, your id dominates when you have an addiction. You're, you're, ego and your superego that should limit you in an ideal world, they're not limiting the way that they should and that imbalance is creating um, an id-dominated uh, problem for the individual. 
for years, uh, people have studied a lot of questions about drug addiction. And one of the most important that people have studied, both for humans as well as for animals, uh, is do people use drugs like, for example, cocaine and drugs like heroin, do they use those for social reasons or do they use them for chemical dependency reasons? Is it because they're just chemically addicted or is there sort of a social, uh, uh, I guess, desire that's causing that use to occur? Uh, most of the time, I think most people would argue both factors are involved, but which factor tends to be more substantial um, and how present are those two factors in different circumstances? That's an ever-present question when it comes time to looking at and researching drug addiction. A uh, question I have for you is this. If you were a psychologist and you had to test out whether drug dependency is chemical in nature, what could you do? Uh, it's a challenging question, and you can probably guess one of the biggest reasons it's challenging is that you're trying to study something that is implicitly harmful to anybody who might be your test subject. And so unlike something like you know hitting a bobo doll where there's no real risk, it'd be very difficult to actually look at a human being and their drug addiction in a proper lab setting experiment uh, unless you were very, very careful about how you went about that. Because of course, those substances, just giving them to the individual uh, would in many cases be seen as highly unethical and highly wrong. Um, one solution for how to study these pro problems uh, that emerged in the 1960s was this drug trial. Uh, the drug trial involved these little guys here. Uh, and in fact, as I mentioned before, it wasn't just referred to as the drug trials over time, but it actually came known as the monkey drug trials. Uh, in 1969, a group of mostly anonymous scientists used a number of monkeys in lab settings to test whether or not A, drug addiction could go beyond the human species, and then B, to test just how chemical drug dependency was, because of course there's a very close correlation between monkeys and other primates uh, and humans in terms of our sort of biochemistry. Uh, the way the experiment worked was as follows, and I apologize if this is uh, a little bit sensitive. Uh, the reality is that it was a horrific experiment, uh, and it was hard to believe that it actually happened. Uh, essentially, the first part of the procedure involved the monkeys being given drugs. Uh, they had to start to introduce drugs that monkeys would typically not know about or not use to the monkeys. And so monkeys were given different drugs. Uh, I'll put a list up in a second, but there are things like cocaine, morphine, uh, alcohol, uh, amphetamines, like for example, speed, so on and so forth. And different monkeys were given different drugs. Uh, they were given them on regular intervals and they were given them through injection given by a uh, doctor or scientist. The next step to the procedure was that they wanted to show that the animals or whether or not the animals uh, were, were, were becoming addicted. And so after the animals got used to the substances, they were then taught how to inject themselves. And while they're still being injected by a scientist, as they're being injected, they were introduced to devices put into the cages, typically self-administered needles, that the monkeys could actually go up to, put their arms next to, to, uh, to get the, the, the particular substance. Uh, once the monkeys have been taught how to self-inject them, they've been shown and sort of taught these procedures, uh, the final step was that the scientists stepped aside. They stopped giving the drugs to the monkeys, but they allowed the monkeys to have access to the self-administering uh, technologies within the cage. And the question, of course, was that if you left the monkeys alone and you no longer created human sort of putting the drug into the monkey, would the monkey at this particular point, having gotten used to the drugs, would they self-administer the drugs? Would they become monkey drug addicts? And these, again, you can see were the different drugs. So morphine, codeine, cocaine, amphetamines, alcohol, et cetera. Um, can you guess what happened? Well, I mean, you probably can just based on where we've been going with this experiment. The reality was that the drugs really did become something that the monkeys got addicted to. Um, not every drug and not every monkey created a dependency, but in the vast majority of the cases, particularly for some of the more addictive drugs like heroin, uh, most of the monkeys did become addicted. Uh, and they suffered horribly as a result, uh, with some monkeys even injecting themselves every hour with these drugs, far more than you can actually survive doing. Um, not surprisingly, the physical toll was horrific. And I'm just going to give you a few samples of what happened. Uh, first, the monkeys who were given cocaine, many of them had severe convulsions. Some of them even tore their own fingers out during hallucinogenic trips. Okay, They saw things uh, that, that weren't there. They had visions, I guess, the same way humans would have never taken uh, uh, cocaine. But during this experience, they, they literally lost their minds. 
Um, those who are given amphetamines like speed, uh, they actually, in some cases, tore, and you can imagine a monkey has a lot of hair, tore the fur off their arms and chest and, and, and had huge amounts of energy release. Uh, and then those who were given cocaine and morphine, they actually often lasted uh, two weeks or less. And they'd just gotten so addicted that hourly injections of morphine and cocaine, it didn't take very long before their heart stopped uh, and, and they had heart attacks and died. Okay. So was it worth it? Well, I mean, I think most people would argue no. Did the study suggest that there was something chemical to drug dependency? Yes, uh, there was at least some scientific value there. But was it a worthwhile sacrifice? Well, even in the 1960s, when animal research was seen a little bit differently than today, and ethics were a little bit more loose as far as animal research, I think most people in the scientific community, when they heard about these studies, said that this is horrific. Um, you've essentially sacrificed the health and well-being of perfectly healthy monkeys to prove something that most people more or less already kind of knew. Um, and that was generally a sort of consensus belief among people that, yes, there is an element of chemical dependency when it comes to drugs. Um, you would never in a million years have done this with people, and yet with monkeys it was allowed. And in fact, for years it became an infamous study, and you're going to see a number of these uh, in your homework today as well as for the journal. You'll have to pick one that you're going to research. But it became one of the most infamous uh, studies of all time, where people just looked at it and said the risk was, was not in any way uh, worth the reward that was given in terms of the research. Now, moving forward a little bit, uh, when we conduct experiments as psychologists, well, we, when psychologists do, um, there's lots of ethical rules that they have to follow. Uh, what are those rules? What makes for a fair and well-run experiment that meets basic, basic ethical requirements versus one that's clearly unethical? Uh, there's a lot of things to consider, but a couple of them worth considering are as follows. Um, first thing is that, I think it's just an obvious people should have to give consent before getting involved in any obtrusive measures or invasions of their privacy. Uh, if you want to be part of an experiment, you're welcome to do so. And in some cases, you can take on certain minor risks, particularly psychological risks uh, that, that, that may be declared. The scientist doesn't have to tell you everything that's going to happen because that would ruin the experiment, but they at least have to give you a realistic understanding of what kind of potential trauma you might deal with, uh, what kind of side effects or risks there are. And hopefully there's not too much of those things uh, to begin with. Second thing is that the risk shouldn't be greater than the reward. Uh, there are going to be moments with any kind of research, psychological, scientific, medical, whatever, where you may have to take risks. And, and, and sometimes if the reward is great enough, the risk may end up being a little bit larger than in other cases. Uh, as an example, uh, I hate referencing it, but I will. Um, we're dealing with a major pandemic. Uh, we don't currently have a vaccine. Uh, they will hopefully within the next year, I think that's the estimate, uh, start to develop vaccines for this. They're not going to just give those vaccines to all people all at once without doing some testing. Uh, will there probably be a small group of humans selected for tests who are given sort of the choice to be participants and are told that there may be a huge risk here, but th there's a lot of reward and it would be necessary? Probably. Um, in fact, yeah, I guarantee that it will happen. Um, that's a situation where it's a hard ethical question for the people involved, but um, you could make an argument that the risk is not greater than the reward. The reward is so enormous. Um, but in other cases, if you have minor sorts of issues you're looking at and you're creating a great risk, then you really have to reconsider. And certainly it's something that all psychologists have to consider. If we're taking chances of any kind, even if they're just minor psychological risks, is the reward worth what we're doing? Um, third question, uh, you should never physically harm uh, participants. And that goes for animals as well. Um, although sometimes it's harder to avoid in those circumstances. Um, but certainly when it comes to physical harm, that's usually considered in modern day a, pr a pretty red line uh, that you don't cross. Psychological harm, yes, as well, although, again, how you draw that line is a little bit less clear. Okay? In certain cases, there may be certain minor psychological sort of risks that you might have to take with people just for authenticity purposes. We saw that with the Milgram and with the ASH to a lesser extent experiments. Um, two final quick points or three final quick points. An experimenter should not get involved in the experiment themselves. Uh, we're going to look at experiment tomorrow, which is the Stanford Prison Experiment, where one of the biggest ethical problems is that that happens. Uh, the person who runs the experiment is Philip Zimbardo. Uh, he, he does it, obviously, at Stanford University in the United States, uh, in California. And he gets involved in his own experiment. In fact, he becomes the head of the prison that he sets up within Stanford's uh, psychology department basement. It's a huge problem because 
a few things happen. First of all, you're corrupting your data. If you're in your experiment, then you're actively manipulating what you're trying to study. And given that you have particular objectives because it's your experiment, right off the bat, it's kind of like you've polluted the water uh, and, and almost everything it, it has lost its value from that point forward. The other issue is that you don't have objective ability to see risks because when it's your experiment and you're involved in it, your involvement may actually cause you to not oversee things in a sensible a way as you would if you're staying on the sidelines. So in a general sense, you don't test yourself. You, you stand aside and you look at other people being tested, but you yourself sort of look from afar. Think of yourself as looking into the fishbowl, but never actually jumping in yourself. Um, two final points. Experiments should be sympathetic to uh, any relevant cultural or social variables. Um, you have to be careful when you're on experiments. Um, not all cultures are the same, and sometimes things that may seem like minor issues for one culture may actually be a big one uh, for another. And certainly if you're going to be dealing with people and dealing with circumstances, you have to consider what are some of the cultural beliefs that may be different uh, that you haven't always necessarily taken account of. Um, just to give you an example, it's not quite experiment, but it could factor in in, in certain cases if you did experiment that involved this data. Um, oftentimes in North American society, we, we avoid the use of 13 because people are superstitious in North American society for some reason towards the number 13. Um, so if you go in an elevator, there's no 13. Uh, it's always one of those ironic, um, um, very sort of, um, I, I guess, Western-centric ideas that 13 is always avoided. Because the reality is that in many cultures, that's not the avoided number. There's other numbers that would have its equivalent, but we regularly use those. Uh, if you went to Japan, uh, 13 is not a number that people are superstitious towards at all which four is. Um, and so if you regularly used four in an experiment, for all you know, that may actually be to a certain extent um, a challenge if you had a superstitious person from that culture who was part of things. Uh, when they released the PlayStation 4, a lot of people thought they would actually never call it the PS4. I don't know if you know this, uh, but they all they all kind of wondered whether they would because there was a fear that it may actually harm sales in Japan where there's a negativity towards that number. Now, ultimately, they ignored the, the, the risk there because it's, it's not everybody superstitious in, in 2020, but it was something that was considered. And it, just a small point to show you that even things you may not take into account, can be a risk in terms of cultural and social variables. Um, final issue uh, is that you should never abuse your research. And I think that's pretty obvious. I'm not gonna spend more time on that. You, you wanna make sure that your research has a good purpose or intent and is hopefully as much as you can um, used for, for good and, and positive purposes. All right, a um, couple of points. I'm just gonna sort of go over your work here. Um, first thing you're going to get, and it's a handout that I provided, is a list that describes seven famous unethical experiments. Um, there are experiments that happened over the years, uh, sometimes had important psychological objectives, sometimes not even really an important objective. Um, but the key idea was that they were done and they crossed ethical lines, and in some cases in a dramatic, scary way. Um, what I want you to do for each of these is I want you to first and foremost just read over the descriptions and for each of them try to identify what were some of the ethical rules that were violated. Uh, I'm not going to go over that in terms of a homework summary. If you've got questions, you, you can ask me, but I think it's going to be pretty obvious. Just kind of look at for each one, what's the problem based on uh, the rules for ethics we just discussed um, and, and why would you not want to do those experiments? What are, what are the problems? Um, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to rank them from most to least unethical and then I want you to choose one of your experiments and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because I'm just going to talk about the assignment and I want you to complete journal five. Uh, with journal five you're essentially going to have to uh, research one of your particular experiments that was discussed there that's unethical and you're going to have to answer a few questions where you reflect upon what was done, um, could it have been improved in some way, um, and, and a few other sort of uh, questions that I've given you. Uh, you may have to do a little bit of research, okay, and I'll talk about that a little bit when I give the video summary for the assignment, but that is going to be something that I'm going to collect, and so please make a point uh, when you finish watching this video of looking into that journal, looking into that sheet that goes with the journal, and then hopefully picking one of those different seven studies uh, on the table and, and following it up with a journal that you'll give me for next Friday. Okay, thank you.